grace and peace. This is New Testament video 467, Romans lesson 46. Romans 12. Once more, our second and last study of Romans 12. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace. We would ask that you bless this study. May it be profitable immensely to thy glory alone. We study these verses now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Romans 12, read verses 1 through 21, the whole chapter. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Our present lesson to the end. Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It's a brief chapter, 21 verses. Romans chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, the fourth and final segment of Romans. Remember Romans 1 through 5, justification, a right standing before God. Romans 6 to 8, sanctification, being set apart under God's purpose. Romans 9 through 11, the dispensation of grace and Israel. Israel's past, present, and future. Romans 12 to 16, now the application of grace. Considering all that has gone before in Romans. 
Paul reaches a conclusion. Romans 12, 1 and following. Romans 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Practical Christian living. How to take the details outlined in the prior chapters and apply them to specific life situations. This is practical information. It is not hypothetical, theoretical, that is, just a group of ideas that don't actually apply to real life. This is useful information. It's not mindless religion. It is not empty, worthless tradition. It is not idle speculation. We should make an effort. An effort to know the will of God. As opposed to, I don't know, what is God's will? Find out. Don't be a lazy man or woman. Search and find answers. In the Word of God, rightly divided, there are answers. Are we really interested in finding them? Studying Bible verses to find the will of God. Romans 12, verse 1. Reviewing last study, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I beseech you therefore, I beg you therefore, I ask you therefore, considering what I have written in the first 11 chapters, live like members of the church, the body of Christ, Romans chapters 1 through 8, and not like the nation Israel. Chapters 9 to 11. See? Very simple. Very simple. Think about it. Think about it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, the mercies, mercies, plural, the abundance of pity, compassion, God has on us that ye present, yield, or show your bodies a living sacrifice. We're living dead people. Holy, set apart, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, logical service, sensible service. This only makes sense this is logical to and be not conformed to this world. You are believers in Christ, are you not? Then conduct yourselves like the people you are and not like the people 
You are not the world. See? Remember the nation Israel. God set Israel apart. You are my nation in the earth. I give you rules and regulations, customs, practices. If you follow them, you will show how you are a different people. You are not like the nations of the world. Huh? But the sinners that they were, the ancient Jewish people, just like any sinful sons and daughters of Adam now, Israel wanted to be like everyone else. They adopted the ways, the thoughts, the views, the practices of the heathen, the pagan Gentile neighbors. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Well, don't condemn Israel too severely. The church, the body of Christ, whether the professing church or the genuine church. We failed miserably there, haven't we? Oh, is that a Christian? I never would have guessed. <laughs> much compromise, much secularism, much worldliness, carnality, immaturity, yes, abounding in our churches, in Christian homes, yes, believe it, believe it, it is so, it is so. Don't be conformed to this world, Romans 12:2. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There. The renewed mind. Don't think like a lost person. Don't think like a non-Christian. Don't think like an unbeliever. Don't think like the nation Israel. Think like a member of the body of Christ. The renewed mind. Throw away the trash thoughts. The garbage thoughts. The rubbish for our British friends. We do that by taking proper thinking. Proper thoughts. Believing them and applying them to life. Very simple. It's so simple, it's scary. Because people tend to be confused concerning the Bible. Isn't that right? That's denominationalism. See, the denominations haven't gotten rid of their trash thoughts either. And they're relying on the flesh instead of the Lord. They're trying to copy the life of Christ instead of enjoying the life of Christ. <laughs> In Romans 12... We see our relationship to God. We see the believer's relationship to spiritual gifts when they were operating. Our relationship to other believers and our relationship to unbelievers, our enemies.
the renewed mind here actually you could take Romans 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16 they are all the renewed mind we have liberty that is one of the four operative principles of Romans 12 liberty we're not under law we're under grace grace teaches us how to live soberly righteously and godly in this present world Titus 2 there's the issue of replacement putting off something and putting on something that's Pauline repentance change in mind hold on there's expediency what is profitable beneficial see we make the right choice instead of oh I'm free to do what I want I can go out and live in sin that ought not to be our mentality that again is immaturity hold on grace and love motivate us the grace and love of God teach us how to live we walk in our identity in Christ especially those chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans we value and esteem things the way God does see we're thinking like God thinks because he has revealed his mind to us in the Holy Bible the Christian life will not operate on the basis of ah, Bible ignorance because it cannot cannot operate on the basis of Bible ignorance Bible ignorance the Bible is the mind of Christ in printed form 1 Corinthians 2 16 God does not want us as Christians to be conformed to the world's profligate example he wants to take his word and renew our minds so that we will think like he does and then our life will reflect the good and acceptable and perfect will of God the key to the Christian life is not obeying a list of rules but rather placing our faith in sound doctrine so that sound doctrine can transform us from the inside out for God's glory Galatians 2 20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain Philippians 1 21 Christ lives his life in and through us we do not live the Christian life because we cannot live the Christian life as we Christians study and believe the Holy Scriptures rightly divided using dispensational Bible study 2 Timothy 2.15 the indwelling Holy Ghost Holy Spirit will utilize that sound doctrine to transform us the more sound doctrine we store in our inner man the more material the Holy Ghost will use inside of us to spiritually mature us for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God which you heard of us you received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe 1 Thessalonians 2.13 spiritual growth requires a daily study of God's word rightly divided and our minds need to be cleansed daily by God's word as taught in Ephesians 5.26 and daily studies fulfill both the scriptures we discuss daily will make a difference in our life and the lives of those around us if we will study them and most importantly if we will believe them
Amen, 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 amen. It is not enough to know, I know the truth, but do you apply it to life? The devil knows the truth. Hmm. Yes. He doesn't tell the truth, but he knows it. <laughs> I would venture to assert more people than we care to know in denominational leadership know the truth. <laughs> They're not telling the truth either though because it's not conducive to upholding the theological system they've embraced. Oh, we can't turn back now, it's too late. Well, foolish. You can turn back. You're not at the judgment seat of Christ yet? You're not in hell yet, huh? Then it's not too late. You can still trust Christ right now. You can still trust His Word rightly divided right now. Uh-huh. Will you? Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. <laughs> Don't be proud, arrogant, haughty. Conceited. But to think soberly. Have a right mind, have a renewed mind, have a sound mind, healthy mind, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. While the Lord was still revealing information, and that would be during the Acts period, the Bible was incomplete. But believers were expected to walk in the light that God had given them, the revelation He had given them, the written word He had given them up to that point. Romans 12, 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. There's the church, the body of Christ. This links to 1 Corinthians 12. The physical body here, here, with its many members, body parts. It's like the church, the body of Christ with its many saints members. And all the members have a job, a role, a function. It's one body with diverse members in the one body. While the Bible was still being written, spiritual gifts were needful. The list of spiritual gifts here in Romans 12 is one of three lists in Paul's epistles. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14. There's another passage on spiritual gifts. And a third spiritual gift passage, Ephesians 4. Romans 12, 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth, on exhortation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Seven spiritual gifts that were needed before the Bible canon was closed. Once Paul wrote the final Bible book, 2 Timothy, 
the spiritual gifts were no longer needed. <gasps> oh, that means we don't have spiritual gifts today. Well, what about our denomination that says we do have spiritual gifts? What about those who seek spiritual gifts and claim they have the spiritual gifts? Well, to be frank, they're wrong. There, we answered that. The spiritual gifts were needed until that which is perfect is come. 1 Corinthians 13. That which is perfect. <laughs> it's not Jesus. It's not dying and going to heaven. The perfect there. Complete revelation. Complete knowledge. Complete prophesying. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. That's revelation. God revealing information. Romans 12, 6, the gift of prophecy, speaking forth the word of God before it was written. Ministry, servants, helps, teaching, exhorting, encouraging, urging, giving with simplicity, selflessness, ruling governments with diligence, eagerness, the gift of showing mercy with cheerfulness. Having sympathy, compassion on the poor, the needy, the destitute, the elderly, the sick, the mourning, the grieving, whatever. Now, here is Paul's last epistle, his farewell epistle. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Scripture. See? Not oral tradition. Not being passed down by word of mouth, but a written record. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching worthy of our trust, for reproof, what are we doing wrong? For correction, how to think properly. For instruction in righteousness, here is the right path down which to travel. That purpose intent, that the man of God may be perfect, that's not sinless. That's truly furnished unto all good works. Perfect is lacking nothing, mature, equipped, completely. The Word of God, the completed Word of God, will work in us to straighten out our thinking and our lives. If, 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 it's an enormous if, if. We want if, 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 if. I hope you get the idea there. If. The completed Word of God working in us equips us to do whatever God wants done. We don't need the spiritual gifts anymore. The spiritual gifts were needful, one, because the Bible was incomplete, and two, lost Israel during Acts needed some confirmation that God was working with the Gentiles through Paul. The spiritual gifts proved that there. Okay? Paul's provoking ministry is finished. 
It has been for 2,000 years. But, see, good denominational doctrine teaches what God did then, He does now. God never changes. If we find it in the Bible, He still does it now. That is a child talking. That is an immature Bible user. That's not a man of God. That's a babe in Christ. If that person even is a believer. Might just be a babe. Not a babe in Christ. A baby. Just a baby. Who seems to be knowledgeable. But isn't. Sounds knowledgeable but isn't. It is totally improper to seek a spiritual gift, to pray, God, give me the spiritual gift that you want. Show me what spiritual gift you've given me. Let me fill out this questionnaire from my preacher. I'll know my spiritual gift. <laughs> Let me go to the preacher. He'll teach me how to use my spiritual gift. He'll give me my spiritual gift. He He'll show me how to speak in tongues, for example. That is a cheap counterfeit. My friend, if you need a person, a mortal human being, to teach you how to use your spiritual gift, oh, I pity you. That is a, a phony system that you're under, that you're in, you'd better run, and I mean quickly, get out. Leave the childish things behind. If you do not, do not complain when your spiritual life disintegrates, when you are disappointed, confused, and perhaps even apostate, I throw away the Bible entirely. I'm done with Christianity. Just remember, here I was, trying to reason with you. There were errors to begin with that you should have recognized when I caught your attention to them. Leave while you still have a chance. Just as I left my denominations and childishness behind, if we do not follow Romans, the two extremes of the sin nature, Adamic nature, are now in view. One, there's the looseness, the wild living, the lasciviousness. That's Corinth. Read the two Corinthian epistles. The other side is legalism, asceticism, works religion. That is Galatians. Paul's epistle to Galatia. Romans is the standard, the deviations, the departures from the standard, or Corinthians and Galatians. Romans chapters 1 to 8, the Galatians didn't follow those chapters, so they wound up in the mess of Galatians. Legalism, law-keeping, Judaism, works religion, denominationalism. Well, Romans 12 to 16, the Corinthians didn't follow those chapters. So they wound up in the mess of Corinthians. Hmm. Now, 2,000 years later, do you know the church, the body of Christ, still hasn't learned Romans? And much of what you see in Christendom now 
is either Corinthians or Galatians. The Corinthians, the Charismatics. The Galatians, the Calvinists. Mm -hmm. The babies with all their fleshly toys. The Corinthians. The me, 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 me. What can I get out of Christian living? And the other side, Galatians. We don't do this and we don't do that. We have our list of rules, regulations, rites, rituals, ceremonies. See, the Corinthians were loose. The Galatians were strict. The Galatians depended on Moses and self-righteousness. The Corinthians, man and philosophy and fleshliness. What feels good will do it. Mm -hmm. Party time. Mm hmm Yes. Very few assemblies. Very few preachers. Very few teachers. Very few individuals, church members ever. Master Romans. They are still stuck in Corinth or Galatia. And Romans is the most basic book of Paul. The most basic book. It gives us a clear gospel of grace. Chapters 1 to 5. It gives us a clear identity of grace living. Romans 6 to 8. It gives specific principles for grace living. Romans 12 to 16. How many people know though? How many want to know? Precious few... Precious few. All right? Romans 12, 9, our current study. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. These Various principles Paul now lists, enumerates in Romans 12. The first one, let love be without dissimulation. Love. What is love? I know the world talks about so-called love, but do they really know what it means? No, of course not. <laughs> love. Seeking another person's highest good. Valuing and esteeming someone or something according to mental processes. One fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Galatians 5.22 Galatians 5.6 Faith which worketh by love. We will remember the church at Corinth did not have love for others, but rather love for self. Remember the last study? This was at the heart of all their problems. They were spiritually immature Christians who thought like lost people because they had no renewed mind to recognize just how outside God's will their congregation really was. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, I ask you, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. They don't have the same mind. They don't have the same judgment. They're quarreling, fighting. Divisions. Divisions. Why? Because they haven't all embraced the truth. See, some have embraced lies. 
assorted principles of philosophy, for example, Greek philosophy. Corinth was only a two-day journey from Athens. Athens was one of those intellectual, <laughs> so-called, those intellectual cities of the ancient world, the capital city of the ancient world, concerning education and philosophy. It's Athens, not far from Corinth. Those false doctrines, humanistic ideas, made their way to Corinth. And Corinth didn't listen to Paul. So those saints in Corinth started looking more and more like lost people than they used to be, instead of believers like they had been when Paul was there. Acts 18. Sound Bible doctrine unites. It's error, falsehood that divides, false teaching. The person complaining about the false doctrine is not dividing the assembly. The people upholding the false doctrine, they are the divisive people. And they need to be forced out of the church. The leaders of the assembly are to have the courage to get rid of the false teachers. Please leave, don't come back. No, we'll let everybody come in. This is a social club. We don't care about doctrine anyway. Whatever you believe, we welcome you. Come on in, worship with us. We all worship the same Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> uh, I don't believe. Wishful thinking. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal fleshly, even as unto babes in Christ. Their children, spiritual children. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able to bear it. Look at that pitiful. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Both Corinthian epistles provide them and us with the sound Bible doctrine we need to fix the Corinthian problems. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation is hypocrisy, pretense, fakery, phoniness. Genuine love. Sincere, real love. 2 Corinthians 6, 6. Love unfeigned. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 Charity out of a pure heart. Charity is love in action. Labor of love. Love is the mental attitude. Charity is the activity resulting from the attitude. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. That is, have genuine love. Don't be a faker. Don't be a phony. Don't pretend. Be a genuine, real lover. This goes beyond, I love you. Or writing, I love you. But actually showing Love, demonstrating love in conduct. Romans 12, 9. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Abhor. Abhor there 
It's from the Latin language. It means to shudder away from. Ooh, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Abhor. Someone is utterly detesting or hating evil there. If we have a renewed mind, verses 1 and 2, such sound Bible doctrine equips us with the ability to discern what is evil, bad, dislike what is evil, and avoid what is evil. Whereas we distance ourselves from wrong thoughts and activities, Romans 12, 9, we cleave to that which is good. Cleave there. Cleave is like glue. Stick to it like glue. Cling to it. Cleave. The husband and wife shall cleave. The husband will cleave to his wife. Genesis 2. Like wallpaper on a wall. Cleave to that which is good. Remember I told you about put off and put on? Turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. If you look at, for example, in your own time, the book of Ephesians, six chapters, Colossians, four chapters, both of those books can be divided into doctrine, duty, wealth, walk. The first three chapters of Ephesians, the first two chapters of Colossians, doctrine. The latter three chapters of Ephesians, the latter two chapters of Colossians, duty. So we'll look at Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind, we have a renewed mind, don't we? The vanity of their mind, that's Romans 1. Having the understanding darkened, Ephesians 4.18, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, that's Romans 1. The nations, those without Jesus Christ, that's them there. You, saints in Ephesus, you are not without Christ. Act like it. Think like it. Ephesians 4, 18, 19 now. Who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, looseness, wild living, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Ah, oh, look the world. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, the old nature, the old lifestyle, the old identity, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Romans 12. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You read the rest of Ephesians 4. There's the new identity we have in Christ and how it makes a difference in our life every day. Or should, or should. Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, one, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
Set your affection on things above. Think on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, lusts, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, see you put off and you put on, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You read the rest of Colossians 3, read Colossians 4. There's the renewed mind and the resultant conduct, the walk to match the wealth we have in Christ. We put off the old lifestyle and its fruit, Adam, and we put on the new lifestyle and its fruit, Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. See that? You find out what is good, you judge what is good, and you stay with that. Hold fast. Don't let it go. So we cannot be shallow, permissive. It doesn't matter what we believe, where we go to church, what Bible version we use. It does. Because if we don't have the truth, if we don't embrace the truth, we can't follow those verses. We can't obey the verses. Unless we know what is good. Unless we hold fast to that which is good unless we cling to that which is good. Romans 12.10 Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Since we are family members in one body of Christ, it only stands to reason we should care for one another and be kind to each other just as natural biological brothers and sisters cherish their siblings. Romans 12.10 Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Brotherly love. Love for the brethren. Such love should naturally exist between all believers, whether the members of the body of Christ or the members of the little flock. Brotherly love. Romans 13, verse 7. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, 
Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 1 Thessalonians 4.9 But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Look at the little flock now, Israel's believing remnant, the Messianic church. John 13. John 13.34 A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Also the little flock, Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 2 Peter 1 7. And to godliness, add brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. See that? Romans 12 10. In honor, preferring one another. Put others ahead of self. See, the Corinthians didn't do that. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. You can read 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. You can read 1 Corinthians 9 also. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no man seek his own but every man another's wealth. How can I benefit, profit, my brother? Also, you can look at Romans 14. We'll study that, Lord willing, in due time. Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 9. Thinking about others. Not being selfish, but being selfless. Before we take any action, we should consider how it may affect others. Will it destroy the Christian fellowship? Or will it encourage and strengthen our Christian brethren? The what can I get out of it attitude brought on by our sinful flesh is overruled by the Bible instructing us to say, what can others get out of it? Most importantly, we recall that the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, left heaven, took upon himself the form of a servant, and humbled himself. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 5, 4, 3. Philippians 2.3 Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, renewed mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ Jesus thoroughly demonstrated that he loved us, and he endured Calvary's pain and shame because he was seeking our wealth, our forgiveness, our salvation. If Christ thought of others, then Christ in us will think of others. If we let him in us think of others, ah. Romans twelve eleven. Not slothful in business. 
fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not slothful in business. Slothful. That's sluggish, lazy, apathetic, don't care, lethargic. And Christian duties, diligence. That will all gender, engender defeat. Because we have failed to apply that renewed mind of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Christ's example, look at this. John 9. John 9. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Luke 2. I must be about my father's business. Luke 2, 49. I know why my heavenly Father sent me to Israel. My Father's enterprise is to teach His Word to these ignoramuses in the land of Palestine. Well, Father's business today is to teach the completed Bible, His completed Word, to all nations especially Romans to Philemon. Shouldn't we be about our father's business? We should, but are we? Romans 12, 11. Fervent in spirit. Zealous, passionate. The ancient Greeks used this were there fervent, translated fervent, to describe water boiling. Boiling water. Blah, 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 blah. Remember Apollos? Apollos, Acts 18.25. Apollos, instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Remember Romans 10, zealous, but not according to knowledge. Uh, that was Apollos. He was busy in ministry. Mm. But he was preaching a message that was 20 years out of date. What has happened since the baptism of John the Baptist? Christ's earthly ministry. The death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, the salvation of Saul of Tarsus, the commissioning of Paul. Apollos doesn't have a clue about any of that. We ought to be fervent, enthusiastic, eager, passionate in ministry, but have knowledge. Okay? Have sound Bible doctrine undergirding what we're doing. The renewed mind. It's more than just busyness. It's the renewed mind. Romans 12, 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the preacher. No, serving the church. No, serving the teacher. No, serving self. No, serving the board of directors. No, serving the professor. No, 
Serving the seminary? No. Serving the denomination? No. Serving the cult? No. Serving the sick? No. Serving the Lord? Serving the Lord. Acts 20, 19. Paul's testimony. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Serving the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, know ye not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We serve God, because we belong to Him. See? Serve the Lord. Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free. Colossians 3, 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. A couple more. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And if we know the will of the Lord, we understand the will of the Lord, then we can serve the Lord. If we don't know, if we don't understand, how can we serve the Lord? We can't. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing. Romans 5, 2. By whom our Lord Jesus Christ also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There's hope in verse 4, verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed. There's the hope of Romans 8. The enthusiastic anticipation of a guaranteed thing that is coming. Hope. Hope. Romans 8. Verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Glorified bodies, resurrected bodies, deliverance from the presence of sin. Resurrection, our glorification in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 Here is an easy verse to memorize. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 Rejoice evermore. <laughs> That's the entire verse. 
Whatever troubles or difficulties we currently face are nothing compared to our eternal glorification in the heavenly places. Hope is an enthusiastic anticipation of a guaranteed thing that is coming. We are awaiting glorified bodies fashioned like Jesus' glorious body. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Such joy and hope should sustain us, keep us going, delivering us from despair, hopelessness, depression. See Paul's joy epistle, Philippians which he wrote during his two-year house arrest at the close of the book of Acts. You read Philippians 1, you read Philippians 2, Philippians 3, Philippians 4. Joy, rejoice, joy, rejoice. And Paul is under house arrest writing all of that. Hmm. Poor me, poor me. No, you don't find that in Philippians. What did I do to deserve this? Why are you punishing me, God? None of that either. Philippians 4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, all the way. And again I say, rejoice. I'm under house arrest in Rome. Rejoice! Anyway, I rejoice anyway. I rejoice in the Lord, not in the circumstances in the Lord. My joy is in Him. Romans 12, 12. Patient in tribulation. Remember Romans 5 there, Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation, troubles, troubles. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword... 2 Corinthians 1, 4. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Look, look the joy. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye you know, that's Acts 17, trouble in Thessalonica, the riot. Second Thessalonians 1.4 so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. They are suffering. The Thessalonians are suffering. These troubles in general, patient and tribulation, to put up with it. These troubles in general can be used as an occasion to grow in grace as opposed to an opportunity to complain, have pity parties, or ask, where God is. Where is God? We have not been guaranteed carefree living, but God has promised us the grace to survive all circumstances, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 12. See? Renewed mind. Proper thinking. Mature thinking. Grace thinking. 
2 Corinthians 12, 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Philippians. Philippians 4. 11. Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have learned this. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There is a man of God talking. Not a babe in Christ, but a full-grown adult son of God. Why is this happening to me? What did we do to deserve this? Where is God? No. We know where God is. He's in our soul. The Holy Spirit indwells us. That's God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is in heaven. God the Son is in heaven. We don't wonder where God is. We know where He is. We know where the three members of the Godhead are. But where is our thinking? There's the big question. Where is our mind, renewed mind? See? Romans 12, 12. Continuing instant in prayer. Instant, it, it means to stand in. Continue standing in prayer. Look at the Messianic Church. This is not a literal posture, by the way. Acts 1, 14. Try this, Acts 1, 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer. Continue, see? In supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Ephesians 6, 18. Prayer. Here's the body of Christ now. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Praying according to the Holy Spirit's word to us. Paul's epistles. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Colossians 4.12 Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Don't be ignoramuses. That's what he prays for these Colossians. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Another easy verse to commit to memory. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. 1 Timothy 2.8 I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Philemon 4. Philemon 4. 
I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. See these numerous references to prayer, prayer, prayer. Prayer is talking to God in light of his word, words to us. We need to pay special attention to Romans, to Philemon. What God has told us through our apostle, Paul. We use prayer not to change God's mind or get him to do something he is not doing, but rather to reinforce in our minds and hearts the sound Bible doctrine that forms the foundation for a victorious Christian living. There are four model Pauline prayers in Scripture. Study them. Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Colossians 1, 9 through 13. The Holy Spirit through Paul prayed that for believers in Christ, the body of Christ, we need to pray that. We don't go to the Our Father prayer, the Sermon on the Mount, the Old Testament, Israel's prayer promises, name and claim. Disappointment. That's not faith, that's unbelief. What did God tell us? Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon. Romans 12, 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Distributing. That word was also translated partakers. Romans 15, 27, Hebrews 2, 14, 1 Peter 4, 13, 2 John 11. Members of the body of Christ should meet the needs of one another. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Romans 15, 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. That's the poor saints at Jerusalem. The little flock. Israel's believing remnant. You read Romans 15, 26, 27. Paul's Gentile believers are giving financial aid to the poor saints at Jerusalem. See? They're all believers in Christ. Whether the little flock or the body of Christ, they're separate and distinct groups, but they're still in Christ, not in Adam. See? You can read 1 Corinthians 16, as well as the three chapters on giving there, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. Here are a couple other verses. Galatians 6, 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate, share, Communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. The Bible teacher is being paid there. The listener, the audience, supports the Bible teacher's ministry. Financially, whether with money or food or shelter, whatever. Galatians 6, 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, fellow saints. First Timothy 6, 17 and 18. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. Materialism. 
but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, see, ready to share what they have with others. Don't be misers, don't be greedy, don't be selfish, don't be cheapskates. Romans 12, 13, given to hospitality, given to. That's the same as that Greek word in verse 14, persecute. Given to means to chase or to pursue. That's also the definition of persecute, to follow after. First Timothy 3 2, there's a case of hospitality, loving strangers. First Timothy 3 2. The qualifications of the bishop. First Timothy 3 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Hebrews 13, 2. Here's the little flock. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Pursue the love of strangers, not just friends. During the New Testament times, travel was hazardous, and hotels were rare and expensive. So it was a mark of Christian maturity to open one's home up to guests, providing them with food, drink, lodging. Christians should be especially kind to fellow believers. You read 1 Timothy 5.10, those widows there, you look at that. These believing older women. 1 Timothy 5.10 Well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. See? The marks of spiritual maturity. Romans 12, 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. So now for the rest of the chapter, we get to persecution, misfortune, how to deal with enemies, unbelievers or even adversarial saints. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Speak well of those who chase you, to harm you, injure you, kill you. Remember the Lord's words in the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The Sermon on the Plain, Luke 6, 27. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. 1 Corinthians 4.12 And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. 1 Peter 2, 21. 1 Peter 2, 21. 
For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That was Christ, especially during those trials, when people lied about him and blasphemed him, accused him falsely. Shh! He was silent. We should not malign or insult those who persecute us. Christ, Paul, and Peter all agree here. The word persecute in Greek conveys the idea of chasing or following someone. See, given to, in verse 13, given to hospitality, chasing hospitality. Now it's chasing believers. <laughs> Trailing saints for the sake of mistreating, injuring, or killing them. Believers in Christ have been subjected to this abuse throughout history especially at the hands of those in positions of power. Church hierarchies, governments, and so on. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. In John 15, 18 to 25, the Lord Jesus reminded his little flock that if the world hated him, the world would hate his little flock. And they will hate us, the church, the body of Christ. You read 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 5. The persecution of the Messianic Church in the ages to come. That evil world system is here right now, and it persecutes us. Its participants abuse us. Evil world system. When you become a Christian, all your troubles go away. Well, that wasn't true of me. For me, it wasn't true of Paul. It hasn't been true of any saint. Ever. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. We should feel joy with those who are joyful. And we should grieve with those who are grieving. This tenderheartedness and supportive spirit will demonstrate to people. We really have something and someone worth believing. Look at this. Job 30, verse 25. Job 30, verse 25. Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? See? That's Job talking. He was a saint. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Unison. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 3. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Hebrews 13, 3. Hebrews 13, 3. Remember then 
them that are in bonds in jail as bound with them. They're suffering for righteousness sake. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. John 11.35, the shortest Bible verse, Jesus wept. That was at Lazarus' grave. His friend Lazarus is dead, and Jesus cried. Lazarus' sisters were mourning. Lots of Jews were there mourning. The Lord Jesus, he didn't show up there. Hey, what's wrong? He wept also. He not only sympathized, he empathized. He recognized their pain and he felt their pain. Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Back to that renewed mind. We are to be as impartial or unbiased as possible, not favoring one person over another. There's favoritism in James 2. You can read James chapter 2, the opening verses. God, with God there is no respect of persons, Romans 2.11. Be of one mind, 1 Corinthians 1. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, the one mind. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Philippians 2.2 2. Philippians 2.2 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 2. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Quit fighting. 1 Peter 3, 8. The little flock. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Romans 12, 16. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Verse 3. Think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Proper thinking. Here's the renewed mind. Don't mind high things. Self-seeking pride should not be our motivation. Condescend to men of low estate. Don't think yourself to be better than others. Romans 12, 16. Be not wise in your own conceits. Again, verse 3. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Think soberly. Don't be high-minded. Remember Romans eleven twenty. Don't be wise in your own conceits. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Conceited. To have an exaggerated high opinion of self. 
the pagans do. Romans 1.22 Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> Acts 20.19 There's the humility of mind. Colossians 3.12 The humbleness of mind. Proverbs 3.7 Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 26, 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. <laughs> That's a good one. Verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. Proverbs 28, 11. The rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. Back to Romans 12, 17, persecution again. Romans 12, 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So we finish the chapter. Oof. This will be complex. Many verses to take in. Ready? Romans 12, 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Personal retribution is in view here. Paying back those who have wronged us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing. Speak well. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Recompense to no man evil for evil. This in no way precludes the utilization of government or the legal system to pursue justice in the case of wrongdoing. Romans chapter 13 and government. That will be our next lesson. God instituted government to punish evil, human government. The law of Moses made provision for government to punish criminals. Romans 12 is talking about personal retribution. It does not prohibit going to court when necessary. We'll say more about it in Romans 13. Romans 12, 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. We should not allow people any opportunity to question our honesty. Our Christian conduct ought not to be a poor testimony that discourages people from wanting to trust Christ. 2 Corinthians 8.21 Provide 
striving for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. 1 Timothy 3, 7. Moreover, he must have a good report, the bishop, of them which are without, lest they fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. We should be especially careful with 1 Thessalonians 5.22 in mind. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Not just form of evil, appearance of evil. If it looks bad, don't do it. If it looks evil, don't do it. It may not be evil, but if it has that appearance, don't do it. When in doubt, it's best not to engage in that conduct. In 2 Corinthians 8, 16-23, Paul did not want to be accused of mishandling money. So instead of presuming to take over financial matters, he offered to send money to Jerusalem by the men the Corinthians chose. 1 Corinthians 16, 1-4. We should behave, we should conduct ourselves like the people we are in Christ. And not like the people we aren't in Athens. Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We should make every attempt possible to get along with others, especially with our Christian brethren. As always, please remember that we never, ever compromise sound Bible doctrine for the sake of unity. But there does come a point where we cannot resolve conflict and we must leave the situation alone. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, Romans 12, 18. It is not always possible to live peaceably, even with fellow Christians, which again is so sad. In fact, there are such deep divisions among some Christians, including myself, that they cannot be resolved until heaven. I have met some people who cause their own problems, thereby making other people's lives and mine miserable. We all make mistakes, but what makes it sadder is that even after they are warned repeatedly, they continue in their error with little to no remorse. When dealing with these kinds of people who absolutely refuse to apply sound Bible doctrine in handling a disagreement, we must step back and say, there is nothing more that I can do. It is time to leave these individuals alone. Again, we apply Romans 12, 18 and move on. Otherwise, we risk making the situation worse with hatred, bitterness, physical altercations, gossiping, cursing, and so on. We should try to get along with others, but they may not necessarily want to get along with us. Amen, 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 amen. Regrettably, sin causes squabbling, which results in division. Our friends will turn other friends against us. And divorce destroys our marriages and families. It is most pitiful when these divisions occur within the local church, disrupting the unity of God's people and furthering the plan of the adversary, Satan. While we do forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us, Ephesians 4.32, we are not to be doormats. In this sinful world, we cannot live harmoniously with everyone, if it be possible, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men, if. Mark 9.50 
Mark 9.50 Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another? Romans 14.19 Romans 14.19 Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. See? Not self, selflessness. Not selfishness. Think of others. Think of others. 1 Peter 3.11 Let him eschew evil, avoid evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. See, there's the little flock. Romans 12, verse 19. Get a little heavier now. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't take vengeance. Let the Lord do it. Don't take it upon yourself. Let God take care of it. Give place to wrath. Don't avenge yourselves. For it is written. There is a Bible manuscript copy in Paul's possession. This is Deuteronomy. Not was written, but is presently, currently written. When people do us wrong, human nature wants to retaliate, to devise a plan to get even. Amen, 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 amen. Romans 12 19 causes us to think otherwise, literally. Deuteronomy 32, 35 Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12, 19 is quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35. To me belongeth vengeance. And recompense their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them shall make haste this originally described God chastening or chastising Israel for their wickedness he will do this during the seven year tribulation too Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. Hebrews 10. Remember, Hebrews is the ages to come. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under the foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's unbelieving Israel warned, Hey, wrath is on the way. Jesus Christ is coming back. The baptism with fire. God's wrath, Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year tribulation, is still postponed. God has not yet poured out His wrath on wicked men. That's Paul's ministry. That's Paul's message. 
Psalm 2, 4, and 5. Look. Psalm 2, 4, and 5. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. The Old Testament timeline, you read Psalm 2 there, was Calvary, the wrath, and the kingdom. Where's the age of grace? Where's the church, the body of Christ? Not in Psalms. The 2,000 year long dispensation of grace is not there. God hid it from David in Psalm 2. The wrath, the vexation that should have transpired in Acts did not because God changed the program with Saul Paul in Acts 9. We've taught that so many times over and over and over. For nearly 2,000 years, our sinful world has enjoyed the riches of God's grace. God is extending our dispensation of grace so that more people can get saved before His wrath is poured out on earth. 2 Peter 3 Scoffers mock God, having deceived themselves into thinking that they will never face His righteous wrath. What foolishness! 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. We need not pay back those who hurt us, for that sin will either be dealt with at Christ's cross, if these people trust Christ, or they will have to pay for that sin by enduring God's wrath during the tribulation and finally suffering in the everlasting lake of fire. Psalm 94, 1 and 2. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth. Show thyself, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. That's the little flock during Daniel's 70th week, crying out for justice. Punish the Antichrist, Lord. Come back and save us, and He will. The second coming of Christ is the answer to that prayer. That imprecatory prayer. Romans 2, 5-9, the righteous judgment of God. He will render to every man according to his deeds, to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish. Rest assured, no injustice will ever go unpunished, for vengeance belongeth unto the Lord. Romans 12, 19 explains that God himself will ultimately take vengeance on those who harm us. Its context explains how it is our responsibility as Christians to let God's grace teach us how to handle that mistreatment. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Romans 12, 17. When people do us wrong, our flesh wants to retaliate to get even, but God's word exhorts us to recompense to no man evil for evil. Please understand that God instituted government and he encourages us to seek legal intervention in severe cases of wrongdoing. Romans 13, 1-5 As Christians living in a fallen world, a corrupted creation, we will suffer abuse and injustice. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Because of sin, unity and peace are not always possible. But it is our responsibility to get along with others as best as we can without compromising God's word, of course. When someone does offend us, grace teaches us that God will ultimately exact vengeance on the guilty. Romans 12:19. In the biblical words of a bygone preacher, payday someday, payday someday. Romans 12 explains that whenever God's righteousness is offended, sinned against, 
His justice enforces appropriate punishment, his wrath. Thus, we need not retaliate when people mistreat us. Those sins will either be dealt with at Christ's cross, if these people trust Christ or have trusted Christ, or if they do not trust Christ, they will suffer for those deeds forever in the lake of fire. According to 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 9, the believers in Thessalonica endured persecutions and tribulations. Sound familiar? Notice the comfort the Apostle Paul gave them in verses 6 to 9. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 9. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. To recompense means to pay back in kind. When Jesus Christ returns to earth at his second coming, he will pay back his, and thus our, enemies. A literal fire will precede him, and it will consume them. That is the wrath of Romans 12, the vengeance of Deuteronomy 32, the wrath of Matthew 3, the fire baptism, Luke 3, Psalm 2, 4, and 5, that wrath. But notice that fire will then give way to everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1. This is when these people die and go to hell and ultimately the lake of fire. The lake of fire is where God's wrath against sin is eternally poured out on those who chose to reject Christ and remain dead in their sins. Them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For sinners, payday someday, either at Christ's cross or the lake of fire. Injustices abound. The wicked are applauded and often go unpunished, while the righteous, God's people, are despised and penalized. As the cliche goes, God never sleeps. All wrongs will be righted one day. Romans 12, 19. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross, He purchased our salvation. There He suffered God's eternal wrath against our sin. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Isaiah 53, 10. Matthew 26, 46. Galatians 3, 13. Once we trust Jesus Christ alone as our personal Savior, Christ's finished cross work for our sins is applied, imputed to us. And we will never suffer God's wrath, for Christ suffered that wrath for us. However, those who physically die without having trusted Christ will remain forever dead in their trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2.1 The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 Physical and spiritual death. Thus, they must pay for those sins by suffering the eternal wrath of God against sin. The everlasting lake of fire, the second or spiritual death of Revelation 21.8. For the past 2,000 years, God has been offering the world His grace and peace. But when this, the dispensation of grace, ends at the rapture, God shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure, Psalm 2, 5. During that seven-year tribulation, the day of the Lord's vengeance, Isaiah 34, 8, the day of vengeance of our God, Isaiah 61, 2, and the days of vengeance, Luke 21, 22. Our wicked world will finally experience God's righteous wrath. According to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9, Christ's second coming will conclude those seven years, and fire will further execute vengeance on God's enemies, Christ's rejectors. Nahum 1, 2, and 3, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. 
The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Indeed, vengeance belongeth unto the Lord. There's one more verse there we can look at. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testify. Two more verses in Romans 12. Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, 20. Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Paul is quoting... Proverbs. He has the book of Proverbs, a manuscript copy of Proverbs. Psalms, Proverbs, 25-21. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. We should be humane or cordial to our enemies, supplying them with food or drink or some other act of kindness. Remember Matthew 5.44? Read it again. Matthew 5.44 But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Luke 6, 27 and 28 again. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Romans 12, 20. Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. The heaping coals of fire on the enemy's head is somewhat obscure, but may be based on the ancient Egyptian custom or practice of carrying a hot container of coals on the head as an expression of guilt or shame for misconduct. There was a public admission of guilt, shame, remorse by carrying that tray of hot coals on the head in Egypt, ancient Egypt. What Proverbs and Romans are referring to in the ancient world. The fire represented burning disgrace and remorse in the situation of Christians doing good to those who treated them wrongly. Such friendliness will generate mental misery, torture, such as shame or guilt, perhaps even repentance, a change in mind, and possible conversion to Christ. Doing good to the enemy will torture the enemy. Mental misery, anguish. <laughs> Perhaps even bring them the faith in Christ. Romans 12, 21. One more verse. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. By submitting to those prior verses... 17, 18, 19, 20. 
We will conquer evil and thereby prevent evil from dominating us. We bless them which persecute us. We bless and curse not. 14. We live peaceably with all men as much as possible. Verse 18. We can let evil overcome, defeat us, grudges, bitterness. Or we can defeat evil by doing good to those who have harmed us, especially if they are Christians. Galatians 6.10 And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32 We need not repay evil for evil. By faith we send that mistreatment to Christ's cross. We forgive it and we move on. Lest it be a hindrance. 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything... To whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan will use a grudge, bitterness, to divide the congregation. You better send the wrong Calvary's cross where God punished sin. Beloved, we need not avenge ourselves, for vengeance belongeth unto the Lord. He will be just, he will be fair. Evil does not have to conquer us. We, with the renewed mind, can conquer evil. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices, schemes. You know, fourteen years ago, I was conversing with another believer. The topic at hand was Bible versions. Of course, I was explaining to him why I used the King James Bible. He preferred modern versions. The discussion became so heated, he came right up to me. Now he was much shorter than I am. So he only came up to about here, but he stared at this part of my body and he screamed at me. He yelled and he cursed me out. Vulgar language. His emotions got the best of him. I stood calmly. I didn't answer. I left the area. Do you know, just a few days back, that believer called me on the phone. He did not specify the incident or the subject. He simply stated, do you remember when we had that conversation years ago when I yelled at you? Of course I knew. I said yes. 
He says, I'd like to apologize. I forgave him. I told him that. I forgive you. I didn't have to retaliate. I didn't have to get back, get even. It took 14 years. But the Holy Spirit worked in his heart to make it right. Even if he did not apologize, I still had forgiven him. That is the mature way to think about enemies, even Christian enemies, <laughs> genuine believers who oppose you in ministry, who wrong you, who say bad things about you, who betray you. Maybe it's your favorite pastor, your spouse, your best friend. Send it to Calvary's cross by faith where God put away sin. We don't let bitterness consume us, grudges, Overcome us. That is Romans 12. Thank you, Father God. And now we go along to chapter 13 of Romans. Thank you for Christ dying for our sins, being buried, being raised again, that we would trust Him by faith and walk in that identity we have in Him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. See you in chapter 13 of Romans.